Good afternoon, everybody. Let's, uh, let's resume. My, my name is, is Wayman Johnson, and I teach labor law as an adjunct at the University of Georgia's law school. Uh, from time to time over the last couple of years, as I've stated that we were going to have a labor law class, uh, a tenured professor or so would say, well, that's just a historical artifact, isn't it? The Wagner Act. Uh, you should be teaching something more sexy and up-to-date, like intellectual property or something. But I think anybody who's uh, listened to the comments today from our panels already and thinks about the uh, structure of the National Labor Relations Act knows how vital this act and how vital this study is to the health of our democracy and to many of the social and economic issues that define our present political debate. We're going to turn now to a discussion on some issues that have been raised already today, but we're going to look specifically at the future and about what it looks like in the next decade or so for the development of our labor law. We have uh, four panelists uh, who will speak on different subjects. Uh, Sam Estreicher is going to talk about the politicization of the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, Jeff Hirsch will talk about election reform, one person's streamlined election is another person's ambush election. Uh, Ken Dow Schmidt will talk about our digital lives and how that has affected the workplace and the relationship between employer and employee and what that might mean for the future of our labor law. And Michael Green is going to conclude with his comments about the NLRB as an Uber agency. And I know at least five people in the room who will be very curious about that theory. Uh, so we're going to start uh, with, with, with Sam. Uh, and as, you, as many know, Sam is a professor at NYU and also the director of the Center for Labor and Employment Law at NYU. He's published extensively in labor law and he also still practices as uh, an appellate advocate and an, an ADR advocate. Uh, Sam, turn it over to you. I'm going to stand, even though that's contrary to my usual practice. In my usual practice, I find that standing at the lectern simply highlights my height, which I've <laughs> never regarded as a strong point of, in favor of me. Um, but the chairman wants it. The chairman, what the chairman wants, the chairman gets. Uh, the title of, uh, and by the way, labor law, I, I, I actually welcome a relatively stable body of labor law for obvious reasons. Uh, it's, one of the, it, it's very hard to teach, a I also teach foreign relations law and environmental and administrative law. Decisions coming down all the time, changing rules. I mean, I can't use yesterday's notes, last year's notes. In labor law, the notes are actually of permanent use and it doesn't take that much work to be prepared for a labor law class and so I think there's a positive for stability and nobody's laughing so it must be late in the day. Um, my, to my topic is depoliticization of the National Labor Relations Board colon uh, some administrative steps. I'm not talking about statutory change. I've been in this field a long time and you know my my bushy beard, I think, is some proof of that. Um, you know, I've suggested to my wife I dye my hair and get rid of this beard. She wants to keep it the way it is because she, she likes me in an enfeebled older state. Um, <laughs> during my period on this earth, labor law statutory change is a non-starter. It's not going to happen. It's the third rail of American politics. Raising the retirement age and Social Security and cha or changing the National Labor Relations Act, you die as soon as you try it. So we, we don't try it, and we're not, it's not going to happen. And so all of these law, law review articles about statutory change, they might as well talk about what's going to happen when we get invaded by Mars, because I think there's a greater likelihood of a Martian invasion than a uh, change in the statute. So this is about administrative steps. 
What can the agency do on its own? Now, I put depoliticization in inverted commas. Rob, are you here? Rob, our editor, he didn't want me to use the term inverted commas. Uh, be I did because I wanted to sort of suggest to you that I'm an educated, you know, <laughs> reader of British literature. Uh, there are also single quotation marks. But I have them around the... I have them around the word depoliticization just to indicate to you that I'm not a complete naive. I mean, I understand that this is an agency, that politics is part of it. It's not politics in the sense that you get a call from the President of the United States. That's the FCC. It's a, <laughs> it's a different kind of politics uh, in, in that people uh, are, are appointed, as they should be, because they have certain prior views, and uh, those views are going to influence uh, the of their decision making, not in not, only in 10% of the cases, in 90% of the cases, they're in, everyone's in total agreement because the cases are essentially, and most of what the board does is who did what to whom, when, where, why, and how. Five W's and one H. And the ALJs are a pretty good group at finding out the facts. Uh, actually, there ought to be some way to expedite all that, that process. We've been, that's something to think about. And I want, to, I want ALJs to have shorter opinions. So instead of getting paid by the word, they get paid by the avoided word. Uh, and we get shorter opinions, we'll get it out quicker. I don't know if Dick, Dick, if this is within your province, I don't know if Dick is here. Uh, maybe it's something that has to be worked out with the division of judges, but seriously, we don't need these prolix ALJ opinions. Now, Martians will, because when they come to this earth, they're gonna want a handy uh, industrial history of the United States of America. And where can they get it? NLRB reports. Uh, so. We are furthering the needs of Martians, Martian visitors, but we're not getting opinions out as quickly as we could. So I'm not a naive. I know there's politics involved, but what can we do? I think there's a problem with the image of the agency, with the reputation of the agency, and what can we do to improve its reputation? What can be done through action by the board? I think it's a very good time to be talking about this. We have five members of the board who are not only um, experienced and knowledgeable about labor and employment. The most knowledgeable, of course, is Ken Hirazawa because he's my former student. Second most knowledgeable, <laughs> second most knowledgeable is Harry Johnson because he was my colleague uh, at Jones Day. The others have made do as well as they can. <laughs> I'm only kidding. They are knowledgeable and they care about the agency. And we've got five, we've got a full complement of people who care about the agency. And I think it's time, and this is a good opportunity for them to sort of think constructively about how they can do things a little differently to improve the reputation of the agency. I'm not here to throw bricks at the agency. The agency, given the small budget it has, is a terrific agency. It's, and, and among federal agencies, it's retained its esprit de corps. Uh, it has a pretty good record in most of the, you know, the, the fact-specific cases, which are most of what agencies do. Uh, it is the essential agency for American workers, because American workers, most of them, are never going to have claims that will warrant the attention of lawyers. They're not making enough money. So even if we adopted uh, Saint, Professor Saint Antoine's uniform law, we'd still have a problem. There wouldn't be enough money in it for lawyers. They don't have representation, number one. So this is the source of representation. And to pick up on Dick Griffin's point, it is the source of pressure on wages in the country. It's the essential agency in the United States the essential agency. We want it to be in good shape. We want it to have a good reputation. Uh, and uh, we want to help the agency think about of steps they can take. They're avoidable, avoidable steps and avoidable causes of the, the, the relative decline in reputation that they can deal with, that they can address. So that's what the, the thrust of the, of the paper is about. It's a relatively short paper. It's not as long as one of Harry Johnson's dissents. I think you can read it in a, in a fortnight. <laughs> okay. The three things that I'd like to accomplish by these various suggestions, and they're just suggestions, are one, better information. We want the agency to have the best information when it makes a decision. That will improve its track record in the courts in the hard cases. Look, in the fact-specific cases of who did what, to whom, when, where, and why, and how, Believe me, the board will continue to be affirmed. The circuits do not want oral argument in those cases. They're not going to write opinions in those cases. They're going to summarily affirm. 
They're too busy. Really, they want the sexy case. It's in the sexy cases, in the hard cases, the new, new applications of, of old board law that I think the, the best information, they, the board should work on getting the best information to make a decision. So when it does something like reverse uh, the prior email decision, um, I forgot the name of it. The, the current one is Purple Sage, or is it Purple Communications? Which one is it? <laughs> Purple? Purple Communications, we get some information about it. I mean, I, I, the very long opinions, and I've told Harry, that if he wants me to read his dissents, he's got to have to have an abstract. <laughs> I just don't have enough time, and I'm not getting paid by the word. <laughs> Neither are you, Harry. I understand that. Um, but give me an abstract. It says, you know, these are the three main points. I'd like to know, you know, are we going to clog up employer systems? That's a sort of technical issue. I don't know if the briefs are, I mean, that's an important issue for me. Are we going to clog up their systems? Uh, and I'm interested in those practical logistical issues. I, you may be getting them out of the briefs. I do random sample of briefs that are done for the board, and they, they look like they're all coming from the same writer. Um, they're all kind of boilerplate. You need to be very focused on the questions you want people to answer. Uh, what are those questions you can't get that readily from the parties? Better information is important because it'll lead to better decisions. It'll lead to decisions that are more easily defendable. Be more predictability. Now, I've had a dialogue with my good friend Wilma Liebman, and very few cases get overturned. It doesn't matter. The general view is cases get overturned. And you should be, you, you, it's hard to tell a client this is board law, and the client says, well, tell me some reason now why I shouldn't do what I want to do. There needs to be more stability in board law, and, more, and also the appearance, the perception of stability. I think it's really important. This has been a problem since I started in this field. I know that Eisenhower was the, was the brute that politicized the agency, but since Eisenhower, let's say, this has been a problem because it says that everything is open. It can't be the case that everything is open, in my view. Um, and I think this, for an agency to have that reputation, it undermines compliance and respect. Given a context of a great deal of respect should be owed to the agency. I'm not saying that. Three, less of an appearance of political influence. The board members are not influenced in, in the way other agencies are. They're people of great integrity. But there still is that perception. And I think you need to deal with that perception. So here are my proposals. They're just suggestions, by the way. Uh, I, I want the board to sort of consider them, think about them, and I'd love to be in a conversation with them about it. This is such a great panel that Michael Green has put together and Rob of the Emory Law Review. Uh, it's just a great, great uh, forum. Um, and this can all be done by agency decision. No change in the statute. The statute is not going to change. If you're writing an article about changing the statute, you have lost me. Because if I'm going to read fiction, there are other people I'd rather read. <laughs> Like Hillary Mantel, for example. You're not as good as Hillary Mantel, so don't write this fictionalized stuff. I would suggest a rule of four for policy reversals. Now, you might say, S. Riker, can't you read? There are only three Democrats on the board. Can't you count? Yes, I understand that. The idea is when you change a decision, there should be some bipartisan buy-in. I know this is a radical concept, and I know there's a problem like who goes first. It's the game of chicken. You've had some policy changes now, and all of a sudden we're going to institutionalize it. I think it would be a great rule, a rule of four. Uh, and I think we do a lot, by the way, to, to uh, advance the, uh, the reputation of the agency and promote regularity. And you take it on the chin that you can't get everything you want. You can still write a decision that signals that you are interested in this change, but we don't have four members now, as the justices do in some areas. You can do that. But get the decision out quickly, by the way. It's really important. But don't hold it up for that. Do it in a paragraph with an abstract. But get it out that you're really interested in changing the rule, but you don't have four votes for it. I think that would do, do a great deal. Now, I understand people feel that it's too risky because, you know, maybe the Republican members feel that way now because of, there's been some policy reversal. Someone has to go first, and, every, and this objection will always be there. And I think you should, you should try. Now, if you want an ameliorative principle for the rule of four, you can do the following. I think... Uh, and I've toyed with the idea of the board should publish, not a rule, not a rulemaking, but publish a schedule of issues that it's interested in contemplating a policy reversal. That'll give the agency more flexibility, more notice. Not a rulemaking, by the way. 
We're interested. You do this now in, in inviting briefs, but you don't have to wait for the general counsel. Just, you, this would be a, uh, an agenda of things that you're interested in. I only have five minutes. That's all I need. Thank you, sir. Um, in fact, I may yield some of my time. You have a, you have a notice of, propo of proposed uh, policy uh, revisions, a notice of it. And the board, by decision, says, if, they, if we're not on that notice, we can't change that decision unless we have a unanimous vote. So it's got to be on that notice. Now, there'll be some gamesmanship. You'll overload the list. I know all the arguments. But, you know, you five of you are together. You, have to, you, know, you owe each other respect. Uh, and I, I assume there'll be a cost to that gamesmanship. There should also be a statement of reasons why you're changing. Even if you get four votes, tell us why this decision has to be changed. Now, the Supreme Court, when it first got into this issue, SEC versus Chenery, it never said that agencies should have complete free will in changing their mind. It said, well, if it's, it's, if it's just an issue of first impression, you know, and we've just told you that the, the ground you came up with is not within your authority. There was some, some flexibility there. What is the reason for changing your mind, other than the fact that you thought the board was wrong before? Are there changed circumstances? What are they? That should be part of the opinion. That should, by, again, by board decision, identify the changed circumstances. So that's one set of proposals on policy reversals. I know they don't happen that often, but they actually, if it, Actually, they happen enough to undermine the credibility of the agency in hard cases, uh, and 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 in teaching the teaching the area of law to students. I'm sure that Ted has had the same problem. Uh, even though he's a better teacher than I am, I like to ascribe it to board reversals. It may just be lousy teaching on my part. A second group of proposals: better information. Even if you don't engage in rulemaking, I understand the board. I've been urging them to use rulemaking. I didn't urge them to use to come up with the rules they came up with, um, but they came up with some rules that, that got slammed. And I understand that the board is a little chary of rulemaking. This I understand that it goes to the D.C. Circuit. By the way, D.C. Circuit has changed; uh, it's not the same composition. Uh, but secondly, some of these rules, I initially proposed the notice rule with uh, what's his name again, Charlie Morris. Happily, he took my name off it. Uh, when it was proposed. I'm no longer identified with the rule. But the rule that I propose, a very simple rule, you can get fired for three or four things, and uh, this is the phone number and, and call people. Instead, it was a rule full of examples. I mean, it was just asking for trouble, the notice rule, I believe. And then you had remedies. Why are you cooking up remedies out of the blue? Just give the notice. This is hard enough. You don't have express statutory authority for what you're doing. Don't push too far. Uh, a, a stripped down notice rule I think could pass even today. The DC Circuit has taken back a little bit of what it said in the prior ruling, but without the advisory opinion, which does raise employer free speech issues. He's got to post this. No other agency has all that stuff on their notice rule. And don't set out the remedies. Work them out case by case over time. Um, more information. Maybe bring back the advisory committees. I, we, were speaking with Bill, we were speaking with Bill Gould about this. He had done it. I would have advisory committees that are joint labor management neutral, the best people you can find. And then talk to them. Get a, get a waiver from your ethics people that you can actually talk to these people in a group, in a group. Um, comply with the, the Advisory Committee Act. It's not that hard. Invite comments. I was thinking, for example, um, I have this proposal about improving, uh, improving um, the opportunity of unions to communicate with employees if they can make the requisite showing of interest. I've set it out in a couple of articles. It's sort of an extension of Excelsior. And the, the access you'd give the unions, access similar to what they now get under neutrality agreements. They come to the break room. They have to pass through the security. Don't make it a rule. Say, what do you think of this idea? And invite comments on it. What are the, what are the problems with this idea? Uh, student athletes, you're going down the road on student athletes. Well, what impact is it going to have on amateurism? What impact is it going to, can you actually have collective bargaining without the NCAA there? I mean, all those issues. Maybe they'll get worked out in, in the briefing. Maybe they won't. Um, but it would benefit from a wider public discussion. One minute. Excellent. Continue the rulemaking effort. 
It's going to get, you'll get better at it as your reputation improves. Uh, so I'd urge you to continue it. And then the final proposal, broader Collier deferral. Now, I understand that on, what is it called? Is it Spielberg? Uh, on on post-award respect, whatever it's called. I think it used to be called Spielberg. You've cut back. That's okay. But on, on deferral, the board should not, as a general matter, be involved in in established bargaining relationships, where parties have been bargaining for the last 40 years, they've got a dispute which they've transmuted into a statutory claim, you only harm yourself. You're not going to improve bargaining power for the unions involved. I don't care what happens. I've been following this Caterpillar and also uh, Boeing. You're not improving the bargaining leverage. You can't improve. They have to live with each other. There have arbitration of, of arbitrable issues there, whether the contract permits it. It won't resolve the dispute, but it puts it in a different venue where there might be a resolution. So I would actually, I actually think we should expand, the board should expand Collier deferral. It's not abdication. Collier deferral is we're going to take advantage of the fact it's a mature collective bargaining relationship. Uh, they're going to have to work it out ultimately on their own, and they will, by the way. They'll come up with a settlement agreement ultimately that will uh, negate the charges. And it's not a good place for the agency to get involved as a general matter. Why? Because the agency's principal mission, in my view, is getting to using 10J to reinstate dischargees and holding elections, fast elections, reruns if you need it. Um, that should be the principal role of the agency, not this other stuff. If the payoff to statutory goals is limited, and the, and the harm to the agency's credibility, maybe only in some quarters, uh, uh, but in those quarters, it's, the, the harm is great. So these are, I mean, no, these are things to think about. There may be other things to think about, but the idea is what can we do as friends of the agency to help them get to a point where actually they're improving their reputation in critical quarters? Thank you. Thank you, Professor S. Stryker. It's, uh, it's great. That's quite, you, you can go ahead and get up there if you like. Uh, it's great to hear about recommendations for stability, especially to an audience which takes instability for granted and as a fact of life. So I appreciate your suggestions. Uh, now we're going to turn to Professor Jeff Hirsch, uh, who will talk about election reform. Professor Hirsch is Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and the Geneva Jurgen Rand Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina's Law School. Uh, prior to his academic career, Professor Hirsch was a litigator in the appellate court branch of the National Labor Relations Board in Washington, D.C. Uh, he too writes extensively on labor and employment law issues and is a contributing editor of the Workplace Prof blog. Uh, Jeff? Thank you. Um, well, so thank all of you for coming. Uh, obviously, again, thank the uh, Law Review, who's done a fantastic job. Um, and I do want to do a special thanks to Michael Green. As, as some of you know, he's got a sort of special sideline in organizing academic panels, um, but I think he's really outdone himself with this one. It's pure genius to organize a panel around the non-acquiescence policy. I'm really impressed by that. Um, <laughs> although I have to admit that I'm a big enough labor law nerd that I am actually am genuinely excited about that trend. Um, but obviously, the you know having all the distinguished speakers, present company notwithstanding, um, and the board officials here uh, was is, is fantastic. And, and I do want to do a sort of even picking up a bit on Sam's talk. Um, one thing that's really struck me when the board officials were speaking, because it really confirmed something that I was thinking about, um, as I was weeding through both the uh, representation rules for this paper as well as another paper that exploded thanks to Purple Communication that was issued around the same time. Um, and that's that we really do have a general counsel and board members um, that one, both seriously take their duty to enforce the act and the act's goals itself seriously. Moreover, they're clearly also, although obviously not agreeing in every way, 
uh, actually engaging with each other on an intellectual level. And unfortunately, I don't think that has always been the case, certainly when there hasn't been a full complement of members, but even among members on the board. Um, and I think it's a real credit to them. And more importantly, it's something that's a real benefit to the agency itself as, as well as the act that it enforces. Um, so I did want to sort of congratulate the members on that. Um, it's, it's, it's something that's impressive and important, um, and I think probably doesn't get as much credit as it perhaps deserves. Um, now, one unfortunate sideline of Michael being able to have such a great panel of folks here is that I'm also in the awkward position of talking about a set of rules that f at least five people in the audience have thought about a heck of a lot more than I have. Um, so hopefully they will bear with me and perhaps correct me uh, if I go a little bit astray. Um, obviously, you know, Charlotte Garden, among others, did a nice job setting up the sort of general political uh, machinations that have surrounded the rule. Um, and then we had the chairman and member Miscamara, as well as some others, um, sort of talking about some of the details in the rule. So I'm not going to uh, delve into those. What I really want to sort of focus on is more the practical effects of the rules. And in particular, uh, the argument about or the question about Right, as the title of my paper says, look, is this really dealing with some sort of improper ambush type system, um, or is it something different? Now, as most of you know, of course, the, some of the impetus behind the rules, in addition to the more um, sort of boring, if you will, regulatory streamlining, was the idea, at least from the union side, that particularly the delay in combination with some of the board regulations and, and perhaps limits on their enforcement power have allowed employers in particular, although in a desert election it can obviously go the other way, um, to improperly influence the election or at least undermine the ideal of having employees freely and engage in an informed choice. Right? Too much delay uh, is going to allow particularly as we talked about earlier in the morning with limits on unions' access to employees, um, it's going to tilt the balance too far towards the employers. Right? The risk, though, is if you go too far. Right? Here's where the ambush election um, argument comes into play. I think the dissent put it a little nicer when they described the, some of the rules as being vote now, understand later. Um, and it's something that I, I certainly think that there's something to the, the union side that, that there's too much employer co uh, coercion or at least too much ability for it. But I take the concern about information going to employees seriously as well. I've written quite a bit about it over the years. And I do really think that it, it does undermine the goals of the act if, in fact, the election process is so short that em employees aren't given the access to the information that, frankly, they're only going to get from the employer side of things. Right? So ultimately, though, this really boils down to an empirical question. Of course, we can't answer that because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But if I can just bore you with some numbers and then, and then perhaps talk about where, where at least I see things heading, um, perhaps it'll be a, a start for maybe more questions um, after everyone's done talking. So just a few numbers to think about sort of where we are now. Um, and I'm just pulling these from some of the most recent years where the board has given data. Um, when you're looking at the time period from the filing of a petition for an election, whether it's a, uh, an initial election or a decert, to the actual direction of election, um, overall the median is between 37 to 39 days. Now that is heavily swayed by the fact that 90% of elections, approximately 90%, are stipulated. Because in those elections, it's between 36 and 39 days. But in contested elections, it, it increases to 59 to 70 days. Right? So not surprisingly, there's obviously takes more time to deal with uh, challenges to the election. Right? And obviously, a lot of what the board has, or some of the things the board has done um, in streamlining the, the pre-election challenge process addresses that. Obviously, there is also delay that occurs after the election. Uh, depending on whether or not there's a hearing, it can take between 43 and 73 days on average uh, for the region to issue a decision. And then if it actually goes to the NLRB, uh, those decisions have typically taken over the last few years 95 to 127 days, right, which is getting getting quite along there. And of course, there's plenty of, uh, not plenty, but there's some outlier cases that, that take much longer than that. Right? To the extent that you're getting into the 100 days and more, or even short of that, I would argue, right, that's a real problem. I mean, that's, that's uh, 
sort of ignoring or, or, or blocking what employees may or may not want to be doing as far as their as far as their collective bargaining choices. Um, so I, to the extent that the uh, election process is dragging on that far, I think, and in fact we heard today, that even all the board members agree that something needs to be done. Now the question is, did the board do too much? And here's where I think, uh, just to sort of sell the probably not surprising conclusion I have is, um, I tend not to think that we're going to have an ambush problem. I mean, to me, this is a relatively modest rule. In fact, I think it's fairly anticlimactic, certainly not unimportant. I think the board has done some important um, streamlining things here, and it, it will eliminate some unnecessary delay. But I, I frankly don't think it's going to make a dramatic difference. So let me just talk a little bit about why I, I, I've come to that at least guess. Um, so first of all, when we think about reducing delay, there's obviously there's several different uh, parts of the process that the board has adjusted that, that might affect the delays to a certain extent. But I just want to be clear that the biggest thing is, is what was referred to by one of the board members is right, the 25-day automatic delay that, that's in place for contested elections, right? And what was interesting sort of going through the, both the comments and then the board's um, explanations for the rules, there really wasn't any significant uh, amount of support for that, or at least the defense of that. Right? The, it was very rarely used. <clears throat> it's only there for a board appeal process that just simply isn't done in the vast majority of cases. So, right, at least on the substance, removing that period, I think is, although not everybody would agree, is relatively uncontroversial. Right? Now, that doesn't mean, though, that the result might be too short. And this is where, the, obviously, the debate about whether the board might have put some maximum or minimum time periods or at least some goals into place. And I, I think, frankly, there's a reasonable argument either way on that, that particular question. Right? But what we're left with now is, well, how fast are we likely to see elections? Right? I obviously don't have a clear answer to that. Um, I know some critics of the board rule of cited, there's actually various ways of sort of computing this. Um, I've seen as early as eight days. I, I frankly don't think that's possible. To me, and, and again, I might, maybe somebody's going to correct me, it, to me, if the regions moved at the absolute quickest they possibly could, it seems to me that the minimum period of time between a petition and an election is, in a contested election is 11 days. That's, I'm just getting that from the eight days to schedule a hearing plus the three days of notice posting. But realistically, I, I don't think we'll ever see anything close to that, right? I mean, one, the region obviously has a duty to, right, if it's their view that that's not going to give employees enough time, right, they shouldn't do an election that quickly. Plus, as we all know, the regions have other things to do. They've got plenty of work to do. And you're frankly not going to see, even if they wanted to do extremely quick elections, anything that close. In fact, just to remind you, in stipulated elections, right, uncontested elections, the average number of days between a petition and an election is typically 36 to 39 days. Right? In fact, if I had to guess, and this is going out on a limb here, I would suspect to see in contested elections under the new rules being somewhere around that range. Right? I, I've been known to be wrong, so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that turns out over the years. Right? But if I'm even remotely close, Right, then the next question is, look, is this going to be too short of a period of time? And to me, and again, this, this maybe we'll have some disagreement about this, to me, anything remotely close to that period of time, a month, three weeks, maybe more, right, is plenty of time for employees to get an adequate amount of information both from the union and employee, employers. Right? Although unions certainly like to keep their organizing secret before they file a petition, the fact of the matter is that most employers catch wind of things uh, fairly early on and they can take advantage of the multiple opportunities they have to engage and talk to employees. Right? We've, we've, there's Kate Bronfenbrenner, among others, have um, shown the number of times that employers not surprisingly use captive audience speeches, right? And then even after the petition, even if it comes as a surprise, and I think, right, smaller employers are, are, they, are the particular cohort that we are going to be most worried about, um, right, there's still going to be plenty of time for them to transfer whatever information they feel like needs to be given about their views of unionization. So to there, I really don't think that there's a serious problem with employees getting a fully informed choice. And I also want to mention, putting this in an overall context, right, remembering we're largely just talking about those around 10% of cases that are contested, right? So even if you think that the 
the board's regulations have shortened things up too much. In the vast majority of cases, the parties are going to be have a stipulated election. Now, the board rules might obviously influence that because they're the the different bargaining positions will be slightly altered because the parties now have a perhaps different expectation about what would happen if they do contest the election. Right? But all the sort of criticisms, I think, are overwrought when you think about what's actually likely to happen under these rules and the limited number of cases that the rules are going to directly address. Um, so with that, I know we've got a lot of people talking. I'd like to open it up, make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and sit down now and uh, hear from the next speaker. Thank you, Jeff. And yes, we will have time for questions uh, at the end. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Ken Dow-Schmidt uh, about uh, our digitalized lives, how that affects our work lives and our work relationships. Uh, professor Dow Schmidt is the Willard and Margaret Carr Professor of Labor and Employment Law at Indiana University. He is a recognized teacher and scholar on labor and employment law issues. In 2003, he was awarded Indiana Law's top teaching prize, the Leon H. Wallace Award. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing from you. Go ahead, Ken. Thank you. And I would like to add my thanks to the people that put this together, too. I'm thinking about uh, Michael and Ben and, and, of course, Katya, too who uh, have helped organize this wonderful conference. And I, I've appreciated all the speakers, but I've especially uh, appreciated hearing from the board in the second, in the, second uh, the members of the board in the second uh, panel. I get to hear from my academic colleagues a lot. I get to read their articles, but to actually see all the members of the board and the general counsel in one place and, and get to hear some, actually a very interesting discussion from them and also a very positive discussion, I thought, too, was, um, was reassuring, interesting and reassuring. I'm going to talk about something that is maybe a little uh, less reassuring uh, right now. And uh, it's uh, the impact of the new information technology on the employment relationship. And some of this I've written about before and other people have written about before. But in this uh, essay, I also wanted to think about uh, what's yet to come. And the, as you'll see, there are some very divergent opinions on what's yet to come. I think everybody agrees that the new information technology is not done with changing the employment relationship yet. That, in fact, uh, the changes in the in new information technology are accelerating and, the, and that that will have enormous impacts on the employment relationship to come. Uh, the technologists are uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, negative about what these implications will be for individual work. Economists are much more positive, and I'll talk about that. Uh, and I might even handicap it a little bit. Um, basically, uh, what I'm, in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about Labor Law 1.0, Labor Law 2.0, and Labor Law 3.0, and these are all, of course, software upgrades to, uh, to our interpretation of the National Labor Relations Act and the, and the labor and employment law policies that go along with them. Uh, labor Law 1.0, of course, is the law as it was enacted and originally interpreted uh, it, with the background of uh, the American uh, um, uh, in the industrial age of the early 20th century. And uh, I, um, Labor Law 2.0, is now up to the present time, how it perhaps, you know, there may be some recommended upgrades that we need to go along with how the information technology has changed the employment relationship. And then Labor Law 3.0 is just the speculation about what might happen in the future. And, and when I talk about the new information technology here, I am I'm talking about computers, I'm talking about the internet, I'm talking about, about all the search engines. So it's, it's basically, you know, the, 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 uh, the um, uh, the hardware uh, that we use in, in computers and the internet and, uh, of course, the software that goes along with it. Now, uh, back uh, uh, when the National Labor Relations Act was passed, of course, we were in the industrial age in the American economy. And there, there was, at that time, there was a lot of variety in how production was organized. But it, it's, I think it's fair to say that the, the dominant, at least, production paradigm at the time was that if you, uh, large firms were organized in order to ensure efficient production and the delivery of goods in the right places and parts in the right places at the right time, uh, the, the paradigm for organization was large vertically integrated firms uh, that tried to retain skilled labor through long-term employment. Uh, and uh, so you think about, you know, the automakers, things like that. They may have had parts suppliers and things like that, but they're fairly close relationships. Uh, the the uh, paradigmatic example of this, of course, is the River Rouge plant. When I toured that in 1980, uh, the tour guide actually uh, um, 
bragged, we go from coal and steel to, to Mustangs all under one roof. Uh, and of course, uh, they had a, 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 a skilled workforce that they were trying to hang on to at the time. Now, these large vertically integrated firms, they have what economists refer to as they're governed by the internal labor market. They have administrative rules that uh, help them operate. They have job ladders where good, good employees can progress up these job ladders, and they intend to keep them around for a long time. Uh, they take, they, uh, traditionally, they undertook production largely in one physical place in which the employees could interact. Uh, they, they liked to hang on to skilled employees. They were interested in having benefits for the purposes of, of, um, of uh, um, hanging on to those skilled employees. And at the time, certainly the post-war period, when we were the only intact industrial country in the world, basically, uh, American production was largely insulated from international wage competition. And it was a, it was a, a golden age both for American production and for, for uh, unions in, in the United States. Now, during this time, of course, this is when, at least in the, in the 30s, uh, uh, the National Relations Act is drafted, and it's over this period that it's first, it's kind of envisioned and first interpreted. And we had very simple concepts of, or it was very easy in, in this paradigmatic relationship to know who was your employer, who was your employee, and what is an appropriate bargaining unit. Uh, very simple concepts that we appropriately applied. Uh, the employees interacted in one physical workplace, so uh, they had ready in-person communication to facilitate collective uh, action and organizing, and, and also the traditional bread and butter uh, collective bargaining of the National Relations Act that, that we think of as the traditional bread and butter uh, collective bargaining. It worked well in this industrial system because these large firms had these administrative rules that they had to determine and administer, and unions could actually help with that. Uh, the large firms, at the time, they're insulated from international competition, so giving wage increases, giving benefit increases, that was something that would help them keep their skilled workers uh, attached to them. Uh, the, the, the system, uh, the traditional NLRA system of collective bargaining uh, worked uh, fairly well. Uh, now, uh, of course, this is a, it's, it, the change took place over time, but people tend to identify the late 1970s or 1980 as the time when we kind of changed from, the, from uh, the industrial age to the new information age in terms of what's the paradigm about how we organize production. And what the information technology did was it allowed firms to organize horizontally with multiple partners across the globe and still supply the right number of Mustangs or the right number of parts for Mustangs rather than being large and vertically integrated. And as a result, you see a shift from these large vertically integrated firms who like long-term employment to, to smaller, leaner, horizontally organized firms that coordinate with subcontractors and outsourcers and, 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 and partners and things like this. Uh, and they focus on their core competency, but still the information technology allows them to, to deliver their product to the, to the global market. And uh, because of this change in production, uh, we no longer have these administrative rules, or at least the administrative rules are less important in the firms. Now firms are governed much more by market discipline, by benchmarking and what it would cost to outsource something. Uh, workers may be subcontracted, they may be temporary. There's a new emphasis on labor flexibility. Uh, we, d we no longer need to, maybe skilled workers still, you know, this is, this, I'm glossing over a lot of, uh, with a lot of generality here, but certainly uh, labor flexibility has become much more important to American employers in the second half of the 20th century, and it's because of this change in production technology. And also, because we're now engaged in a global labor market, American labor is subject to global uh, wage competition, low wage competition, and that has put constant downward pressure on wages and, and benefits since, since we've been engaged in this. Uh, th that's not necessarily a function of, of, of uh, uh, union organizing. As I, as I like to point out to people, I teach in China periodically. The minimum wage in Shenzhen right now is $1.25 an hour. Uh, the the medium-sized Chinese firms uh, uh, engage in massive wage theft so that they will work workers uh, 60 or 70 hours a week and pay them for 40 hours a week. So the effective minimum wage is in the 50 cents of an hour. Uh, there's, <laughs> uh, and, and one reason why it's in the 50 cents of an hour is because uh, the, the Chinese employers threaten to go to uh, Vietnam where that is the, the minimum wage uh, if, if, they, if they have to pay more. Uh, there's no way that American workers, whether they were unionized or not unionized, were going to be uh, able to effectively uh, compete with that. Uh, um, uh, unless they were in, just in, incredibly much more productive. Now, uh, Labor Law 2.0 then, what, what is happening now? We have uh, interpretation of the LNRA's key concepts 
of employee, who's an employee, who's an employer, what's the appropriate bargaining unit, taking account of this change in production, that the employer-employee relationship is no longer so simple, that if you want to know what the appropriate bargaining unit is, who can effectively address their concerns about terms and conditions of employment, who they have to address that to, has now gotten much more complex in this, in this, uh, in this relationship, in these, this horizontal organization of the market. And we have the, firm, the uh, board currently uh, reconsidering the joint employer doctrine, uh, both in its McDonald's uh, cases, as, as uh, some members of the board discussed this morning. Uh, actually, uh, I think it was the general counsel discussed that. And then also, of course, the, the uh, Browning-Ferris case, uh, which, where they've solicited, solicited uh, amicus briefs. We also have uh, the board uh, interpreting the NLRA in light of the new information technology itself that we have to take account of the fact that not only you know, firms can use this, this uh, technology to communicate and coordinate, but also employees can use this information to communicate and coordinate. And so uh, we see the board um, actively incorporating this new technology into its idea of concerted activity, the concerted activity doctrine in the Hispanics United, and uh, the presumptive right of employee access to employer email in the purple communications uh, case, and then of course the, the uh, integration of the new information technology into the new board rules that you heard about uh, uh, earlier uh, today also. Uh, now, that's all, we're up to date now. What about the future? Well, the future is somewhat contentious. I'll try to give you what I think people agree on first, and then I'll talk about the differences uh, between the predictions of economists and the predictions of technologists. Uh, it, is, it does seem true that uh, the new information technology is progressing exponentially. Uh, that uh, you have probably heard about Moore's Law, which is this observation, or at least a prediction, that the number of transistors in a minimum cost integrated circuit would double every 12 to 18 months. That does seem to be, to be uh, bearing up. And you can see these little pictures of, of you know, the size of memory and how it has changed over time just in the last 20 years. It keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We also have Grotschel's observation, and I should have an umlaut over the O there, or either that or I should have an E after it, uh, but I don't know enough about my technology to give you an umlaut. Uh, but he observed, he did an empirical study, and he tried to look at the efficiency of software, and so he looked at, over time, these different software applications, how fast can they do routine uh, calculations, and he found that that was uh, increasing exponentially too. So it's not just the hardware that's, that's, uh, that's increasing exponentially, it's also the software that's increasing exponentially. And both of those suggest that, of course, there's going to be even uh, uh, increased imp uh, uh, impact on the employment relationship and on employment in the future. Now, here are things that I think there is some agreement on. Some of it's a little bit controversial. Uh, first of all, uh, the economists would agree that, that uh, this technological change uh, there may be no Pareto improvement out of this technological change. And what I mean by that is that uh, it's not necessary that everybody is made better off by these technological improvements. I mean, people like to think, oh, in the future everything will be better for everybody. That's not necessarily true. There are going to be winners and losers with the adoption of this technology. Some people are going to be displaced and they'll have to be retrained. They may be displaced from a middle-skilled job to a low-skilled job. There will be other workers where this technology will increase their productivity and they will get wage increases. So there will, be, there will be winners and there will be losers out of this. There is a potential uh, for millions of employees to be displaced by this uh, new technology. Uh, Frey and Osborne did a recent estimate that got a fair amount of, of, uh, of attention where they tried to rate American jobs by the kind of tasks that were done and how easily it would be to automate that with the new information technology. And they estimated that 47% of the American workforce was subject to being automated in the next 20 years. That might be a little alarmist. I suspect it won't be that fast. But they do give some very plausible examples. One of the examples they talk about is the new Google car. And if you think about if, if the, once they get this actually working, how many transportation, how many truck drivers, how many taxi cab drivers can be easily replaced by a Google car. And it also, the, the other implication of the Google car is that People will need less cars. We will be able to share Google cars. So the, auto the automakers will also be uh, impacted by the Google car. Um, the third concept I've got up there is job polarization. This is another thing that's showing up in the data. Um, it seems that this technology is not, is not neutral 
in who it replaces. It is true that it is, its automation is affecting low-skill workers, medium-skill workers, and high-skill workers, but at least in the recent recession, it does seem that the mid-skill workers lost disproportionately compared with the low-skilled and the high-skilled. And what happened was that a number of mid-skilled workers, they were, they were more easily replaced, dropped down into the low-skill market and de decreased wages there. I'm going to have to go fairly quickly here. Maybe I, I, I could explain why that's true, but, I'll, but, I'll, but I, I can talk about that later. Uh, but job polarization does seem to be a real phenomenon, at least coming out of the last recession. The last thing is that uh, we have, um, it seems like, increased income inequality out of the new information technology. First of all, it has uh, brought about the globalization of trade and put us in competition with low-wage countries, and uh, even the simple traditional um, um, international trade models will tell you that if a high-wage, high-capital country trades with low-wage, low-capital countries, that will lower wages and it will increase returns to capital, and that's exactly what's happened. The information technology also seems to increase the superstar effect because it allows you to replicate innovations across large firms or across the economy as a whole, which gives you high rewards to individual in to innovations by managers and things like that. But of course, uh, uh, and so they they benefit from it more than more than uh, common workers. The information technology also seems to increase the productivity of capital relative to labor, so that you can predict that cap that returns to capital are going to remain higher. And then, of course, the job polarization, polarization that I mentioned. Now, as I told you, there's some divergence here. <coughs> Economists, based on history, say the new information technology uh, is, is like prior innovations. You know, we had the steam age, we had the electric age, we, uh, we had the industrial organization. The, all of that displaced workers. And they would tell you, don't fall for the lump labor fallacy. Uh, uh, just because some jobs disappear, this, this technology will produce new jobs, people will be retrained for new jobs. You don't have to worry that this is, I mean, there will be displacement, there will be costs from this, there will be losers, but, but uh, it's not that people are going to forever lose their jobs. Uh, um, they also accept that the new information technology may increase income inequality but, uh, among workers between capital and labor, but the economy will adjust. and, and um, uh, even though income inequality may increase, uh, decrease the dynamism of the economy. Now, the real naysayers are the technologists. And there you have, I mean, there's, there's people that, that have written serious articles about this, but I kind of picked the Elon Musk, uh, Bill Gates, St Stephen Hawking. Uh, Elon Musk is the, is the uh, uh, head of Tesla Motors. He's uh, SpaceX, and, and he was, uh, uh, has suggested the, the creation of the Hyperloop to carry people up and down the West Coast. All the, all the millennials know who he is. Uh, most of my colleagues don't know who he is. He, he's given us this very colorful uh, description that artificial intelligence, actually uh, setting up m machines so that they can learn how to do things and quote unquote think, it's not thinking in the same way we do, uh, is quote unquote summoning the demon. And the argument is that once the average computer is smarter than the average person, which they estimate will happen in about 20 years, who knows what's going to happen to the employment relationship, right? Um, Bill Gates uh, just recently said, uh, less colorfully, he just said, I don't know why more people aren't worried about this. Uh, and Stephen Hawking has, uh, has said uh, that it, basically artificial intelligence is going to be the end of humankind. Uh, or at least uh, he, there's no way that biological humans can keep up with, with uh, this exponentially growing technology. Now, uh, Stephen Hawking, I'm sure, is, I know, is, 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 is prone to overstatement. Uh, um, as I said, you know, if you've seen his movie or read his book, uh, he goes from predicting there's a beginning and end of the universe, change a few assumptions, and now there's no beginning or end. Uh, that's, that's an incredible uh, change, uh, at least for, for most of us. Um, nevertheless, it, it can be worrying that some very bright people here say that this is going to be a fundamental change in the relationship between capital and labor. Um, now, what might this mean? Uh, first of all, what my predictions, I'm going to have to side with the economists. I think, I think probably the worst predictions are not true, but at a minimum, there is going to be enormous displacement. There's going to be an enormous need for retraining. Uh, People's useful work lives are probably going to be shortened, even though their lives are probably going to be lengthened. So there is going to be the problem of how do you earn enough money to maintain yourself for your, own, for your whole life when your work life is shortened uh, because you can't keep up with the technology while you're still living longer. And 
probably a larger percent of the population uh, are not going to be productive enough. Uh, as the technology changes, they won't be productive enough to be able to maintain themselves. We already have a sector of the population that's like that, but I think that sector will actually probably grow. Um, now, in terms of the NRA, um, what I think this means is that uh, the board is going to see an increased importance, uh, increased filings by low skill workers and high skill workers. And there is some, there is some, uh, some uh, indication that doctors are talking about organizing, uh, lawyers are talking about organizing. I even had the other day a, an associate at a uh, management side labor law firm tell me, we should be organizing, uh, which would be a very interesting relationship to be in, wouldn't it? If you're, I mean, I, it was always, when I, worked, when I worked for a union firm, our secretaries were organized, and it was always, how do we bargain with them when we're so pro-union, you know? And I, I just imagine what it would be like, you know, trying to be the associate, how do I bargain with my firm when they're so anti-union? But, but uh, and, it, and, I'm, and I'm, it's my job to be anti-union, but nevertheless, it, it, it's probably true that the kind of worker that comes before the board is going to change. I also think and this was touched on a little bit today, that um, it's going to become the board's uh, job to foster uh, worker organization and protect uh, employee collective action outside of traditional collective bargaining, that it's going to be uh, cases like Walmart, our Walmart, uh, which the general counsel talked about in the McDonald's case, where they're going to be advocate, advocating outside of the traditional collective bargaining, and we're going to be applying the National Relations Act outside of outside of the traditional uh, collective bargaining relationship. Also, uh, another point of, of employee organization, the kind of a byproduct of that is, is the organization of employees for uh, political advocacy, which is going to become more important. And that uh, brings us to the last future policies. When you talk to the, the technologists, if the worst case scenario comes about, what does that mean? Uh, they are talking about things like a basic income policy, subsidized training and retraining by the government, which of course is going to have to be paid by the winners out of this technology, and the organization of benefits uh, and society based on citizenship rather than work, which for some of the European countries, that's not such a big problem. But for us, we are very focused on organize, organization of, of society, uh, you, your rewards, your benefits, are all tied to your job. We're going to have to leave all that behind. Now, that may be something that, um, that employers might like too, but once again, we would have to set up a, a, a fairly large uh, social uh, uh, security program based on citizenship uh, uh, rather than work, a, a, a security program and a, a health insurance program. Now, just let me give you one more slide. Just uh, if you're feeling bad about uh, these machines and the, the rise of the machines, here is one thing I think they will never do is uh, you can appreciate uh, good art. And uh, this is the Thomas Benton mural at Indiana University in our auditorium. And I always like to leave my, I'm appreciating art uh, more the older I get, so I'll, I'll just leave you with that. Uh, they have tried to have computers produce some art so far, and so far none of it is very good. But I don't think, even, even the technologists I don't think uh, will uh, tell you that they'll actually appreciate it the way we have. So, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ken. And very thoughtful working, and we will... We will have time for questions in, in just a few moments. Uh, uh, the last speaker on our panel uh, is Michael Green. Uh, in addition to being a scholar, uh, Michael was one of the persons principally responsible for this gathering, so we're grateful to Michael. He's going to talk about expanding uh, protections uh, in the non-union workplace and his uh, theory of the, the Uber agency at the board. Uh, Michael has been a professor at Texas A&M's uh, law school since 03. Uh, from 2008 until 2012, he was appointed and served as the Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development. Uh, and uh, many of us have read Professor Green's scholarship, and we look forward to hearing from him today. Michael. All right. Th thank you very much. Uh, I want to start my presentation off uh, thanking uh, all the people. We, we thank so many people here, and a lot of people have been thanking me, so I'm going to tell a little story where it, you really should be thanking Emory Law School, you should be thanking the dean, you should be thanking Professor Charles Shainer and Ben Klebanoff, because uh, how this all gets started was back in August of 2013, I was appointed as the secretary-elect of the American Bar Association's Labor and Employment Section, um, which is basically just a title. There's nothing you do, you're just a secretary-elect, but you get to go to nice meetings and lunches and dinners. And I went to a dinner in November 2013 in New Orleans, 
and they happened to put me at a table, and I didn't know who those people were at the table, except I had run into Chairman Mark Pierce before, and sat down at the table was member Harry Johnson, and then member Hirasawa was there, and all the rest of the members were there, and they were so collegial, they got along so well, and I thought, wow, this is the first time in 10 years that we've had all five members everyone should see what I see in terms of how well they get along. They're not trying to stab each other in the back. They're not pulling each other's chairs out. And um, I thought that was a great opportunity to kind of bring them together. I also knew that the 80th anniversary was coming up the next year when I would be the secretary of the section. And I just started asking about that. Now, Chairman Pierce mentioned this morning, he said that when I kind of broached it with him, he said he wanted to do it if we were going to do it in the South. Uh, and so that kind of limited some of the options of places where we look. And also we wanted to do it someplace where there was a kind of an, uh, an NLRB regional office close and a good bar around. And so if you start thinking about that, that limits the number of places. And by saying a bar, I meant like the uh, <laughs> practicing bar. Um, um, but, but others have suggested other kinds of bars. But um, and so when we did that, that really limited to only a couple of law schools. And um, one particular law school, who I'm not going to mention their name, but one particular law school actually had identified that they do a symposium every year in administrative law, and we thought it would be good. And they had actually pretty much kind of almost told us yes for quite a while and held us out there. And at the last minute, we were back out in the summer looking for a place for this. And I thought it was so important that I wanted to get with a really good school to fit this. And fortunately, I just called Professor Shainer and contacted him, and he really got the ball rolling. Uh, it really wouldn't have taken place without his support. And so I, I wanted to thank him so much. And once he got Ben Klevinoff involved, then we knew this was going to happen. So I really want to thank them very much for doing this. And I have a misspelling on my, on my first slide that was going to make me jog my memory about this, because Emory Law School, I know, is not in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, <laughs> but um, I was actually being pushed by my dean, well, why don't you just do it at my school? We'll pay for it, we'll pay for it. And I just said, no, I really want to kind of adhere to what uh, the, the chairman wanted and what we initially talked about. And so, again, so thankful to Emory Law School for, for doing this. Now, let me talk about the NLRB as an Uber agency and why, what, what I even mean by that. I'm going to mention the first two quotes I kind of have in my paper. And one of them says, when workers experience the personal devastation of layoffs, terminations, denial of employment, we are the agency that puts people back to work. We get them paid for the wages they lost. Now, of course, that is a quote from Chairman Mark Pierce. The next quote the National Labor Relations Act does not confer authority on the National Labor Relations Board to act as an Uber agency without due regard for and proper accommodation of the enforcement processes established by these other laws and agencies. And that's a quote by member Harry Johnson. And I decided I was going to reconcile those two quotes. Uh, I am a fan of the NLRB. And I really do believe they can be an Uber agency. And so I'll tell you how I got to this point. By the way, there's lots of stuff that pops up on my slides. And that's because sometimes I really believe that it's all about style and not substance. So things will show up on my slides. Um, now, this all started when I was also looking at the 50th anniversary of Title VII. And I was really exploring what all the good things the NLRB was doing. And I started to think, Maybe I should look at that in terms of what happens next after I look at the at Title VII. And then we, I, I ran into the, the made all the board members, and I decided I've got to do something about the National Labor Relations Board at its 80th anniversary. And so what happened then is I came to this new thesis about protections uh, at, at the 80th anniversary. And I was talking to some students in my class, not labor law, by the way, it was employment law, where we were talking about how uh, the, the, the National Labor Relations Board is getting so involved in non-union workplaces. And I asked my students, I said to them, who do you call? Who do you call when the workplace needs you? Who do you call? 
And one of my students blurted out, Ghostbusters. <laughs> and I said, you're too young to know about Ghostbusters. And then she said, oh, you know they're making a new one with all these women who are going to be Ghostbusters? I said, I didn't know. And so I asked, I asked her, though, but why did I say that? She said, well, I don't know. So I said, I'm going to explain that to people. I believe that the NLRB, with its expertise, its unique expertise, and you've heard about the backgrounds of all these members, how much background they have as labor attorneys, but not just labor. They know employment law, employment discrimination, and they really are strategically positioned, now that you have the full five, a full complement, and the general counsel, to really be what I consider an Uber agency. Not, not like not like Member Johnson was talking to him about as an Uber agency, but really a super agency for the workplace times that we're in right now with all of the major legal issues and all of the major technical issues going on in the workplace. They're the ones who are going to be on the front line addressing these issues. So if I'm looking at the NLRB then, my thesis here is who do you call when the workplace needs you? You call the NLRB, the Uber agency for the workplace of our times. Okay. Now, you know who they are, but let me talk about them for a second, just for a second. Chairman Pierce, look at him. I mean, come on. Founding partner, Buffalo Law Firm, practice union and Plato side work, adjunct at Cornell, attorney in LLB Regional Office. Look at this expertise in this area. Now, some people might think it's important he's also a Democrat. And that might be true, but that's not, it doesn't end there. Let's go to Ken Hirozawa. We got him up here. Look at these pictures. I mean, these people have experience in labor and employment law par excellence, right? And if, even when I talk to my students, they care about stuff like what law school you went to. Even that is good, right? Great law schools, great experience, great labor and employment background. Again, another Democrat. Doesn't end there, though. Now we've got Lauren McFerrin, right? NLRB member, associate at a union firm at one point, involved as labor counsel for, uh, with this uh, help committee, and then great schools, clerk of the Fifth Circuit, great background, knows labor employment law, a Democrat. But I can't just leave it all to the Democrats. <laughs> all right, here comes the Republicans. <laughs> Remember Ms. Gamar, partner at a labor law firm, Several years experience management side firms all in the Chicago area, a Wharton MBA, a senior fellow, a Penn Law graduate, labor publications, again, a Republican. Now, then this not last but not least in terms of the members, Harry Johnson. Also a partner in a labor and employment law firm, great background, great experience, several publications, and also a Republican. You look at this experience. You look at this knowledge. These five people know about the workplace. They know what it's like to represent employers and employees in disputes, and they know what's important to those constituencies in trying to resolve these issues. And don't forget the general counsel, because the general counsel's got great expertise too. Look at his background. Served as general counsel for the International uh, Union of Operating Engineers, Board of Directors, AFL-CIO, been an NLRB member, Great background, again, but this is also a Democrat. Now, when you think about that, you can say, okay, that's a great agency to resolve the issues in our workplace. And it's better than any other agency out there. I'll put them up against any other workplace agency right now for resolving the issues in the workplace today. Title VII, we want to deal with that. That was a statutory compromise because they didn't want to have an agency as good as the NLRB. <laughs> The EEOC versus the NLRB, just no comparison. <laughs> Enforcement there, it's assumed that you have to go in the court, not to the agency to help you. So the EEOC may be having some problems now. And so I'm thinking, not the EEOC. And the courts, they're not going to help us either. The courts, you look at the discrimination claims, what happens in the court system, most of the time they don't even bring the claims anymore. They go outside of the court and they get through the summary judgment process. And even on appeal, the employees lose these cases. They're losing them at least 90% of the time in the court system. So that's not going to help us. So if we look at what's going on in the workplace right now, there's all these disputes going on. 
all these concerns, there's lots of charges being brought at the EEOC, there's still evidence that discrimination is going on in the workplace. There was a study just done last year where they sent out legal writing memos to partners at the firm and all they did was change the names and the race of the individuals and there was distinct differences in how they were evaluated. So what do you do? How do we respond? Congress, right? We can get Congress to help us. No, I don't think so. Remember, if you remember several years ago when the EEOC was using testers, uh, then there was a gentleman named Newt Gingrich who threatened to take all their money away if they ever used testers again. And then with the NLRB with the Boeing case, how they threatened to take all the money away. But I'm still saying, I still, I'm putting my hope in the NLRB. I still think the, the great five that is out there, they can, they can deal with these issues. They can help us. They are the Uber agency that can address these issues. Now, will Congress allow it? I don't know. But in these times of economic unrest, we need an agency to work for the workplace. We need people who know what's going on out there, who know how these issues are being dealt with by employers and employees. Now, <laughs> at one point, I tried to explain to my employees, uh, my students in my employment law class, if you think about the National Labor Relations Act in a non-union setting, you ought to think about winning. And the only place where employees have been winning is with the National Labor Relations Act. And in the an AOL website identifies six tips on how to not get fired for your crazy Facebook activity. And almost every one of them was a protection under the National Labor Relations Act. Number one, they said, mock your boss. Feel free. Just make sure you focus on wages and working conditions. <laughs> they said, don't try and be funny or sarcastic, because there have been some that were funny or sarcastic that didn't, didn't add in any concerted activity, and that wasn't good. Get a coworker to join you, and you'll be protected. Mention a plan to act with one other person, and no matter what the crazy thing you say on Facebook, you'll be protected. And then, they said, your company cannot tell you not to talk about the company. Say you want to talk to one other employee about the company and you'll be protected. And then finally, there was a case about public employee speech. And so in a time when employees are losing in every other venue, this is where employees were winning. And so I thought, why not? Look at the power of Section 7. <laughs> Section 7 is the most powerful piece of legislation out there for employees the right for mutual aid and protection. This is where you address these issues. This is the front line. This is why we have this Uber agency out there protecting us with this unfair labor practice available when employers attack mutual aid and, and, and concerted activity. So if we're thinking about it, Section 7, it's not just for when there's a union. It's not just when there's a collective bargaining representative. It can apply in any circumstances, even when a union is not present. And this is where I believe that the Obama board has made some major impacts. Many recent decisions. In fact, it's been a cottage industry for me going out and talking to people about these NLRB decisions in the non-union workplace. Employer counsel I meet all over the country. They're all nervous and wondering, what do we do about these decisions? And so there have been so many in the technological areas. Costco, Hispanics, uh, Hispanics United of Buffalo, all dealing with all this technology and how do we deal with it in the workplace? Don't ask the Supreme Court. They'll say stuff like in the city of Kwan, we're not ready to address this technology yet. So who's ready? The Uber agency. <laughs> the NLRB, they're ready to address this. When these issues come up, they're the ones who are going to take on these issues. And legal issues, too, like immigration. There's great cases coming up. And there's issues that are still out there regarding immigration. There was recently a study done by a law professor who suggested that Hoffman Plastics is probably one of the most uh, uh, particular Supreme Court decisions that is likely to be reversed because of how much it is not followed in various courts. And so maybe that comes up in front of the NLRB again. There have been a number of cases that have addressed it. We've heard about purple communications and email. The Northwestern case, college football employees. 
McDonald's joint employers, workplace speech and harassment, and of course, D.R. Horton and class arbitration, and there's fresh and easy neighborhoods that involves accommodating Title VII. All of these are cutting edge issues. Who's the agency that's gonna decide these? Who's gonna help us understand how to deal with these issues? The NLRB, the Uber agency. <laughs> so I wanna start to transition to the end of this by talking about what, when I said there was a cottage industry, I was going around talking to employers about how to deal with all these cases. And I always came back to what uh, the acting general counsel had put together regarding Walmart's social media policy. I was doing this to explain to people how I thought you should deal with all these issues. And I think it's a good thing that the NLRB is addressing these issues. But then the general counsel just recently decided he was gonna put out a little expl explanation of how to deal with all these rules. And I, I heard yesterday when Brent was talking to him saying, you're taking my business away and doing this. <laughs> you're taking my business away too because <laughs> I was trying to explain these things. And so now I, all I have to do is just say, see the general counsel's memo where he's talking about Wendy's and maybe that's how we resolve all these issues now. But I wanna end talking a little bit about the Fresh and Easy Neighborhood Market case. And in that case, this is also the case where the issue of Uber agency was addressed in a negative way, but I, I think it's positive. You had coworkers there dealing with harassment regarding sexual harassment and whether that complaint is concerted activity. And if you look at Section 7 again, such a powerful tool in the workplace. If two workers are working together to try and deal with sexual harassment in the workplace, it should certainly be covered by the NLRA, and the NLRB should be the agency on the front line. They know more than even the EEOC about labor and employment issues. They've got all that expertise I just showed you, and they know what's good for employers and employees in trying to deal with these issues. They may be split, but their decisions are wonderful. The individual dissents in fresh and even easy market, they might be long. They might have a lot of footnotes, but you know what they also do? They cite to a lot of law review articles. <laughs> and that explains a lot of stuff about how these cases work. There's room out there to understand how law professors can impact the policies that get set here. It was a case that a law professor could love when I saw all of those footnotes all of those sites to law review articles, and I thought, this is how we can impact the workplace. And we know the NLRB is never the last word. I just want them to be the first word as an Uber agency addressing these issues. So while I suggested that employers, I don't know how much time I have left. I'm a, okay. I've thrown oh. away the hook. Oh, you're throwing <laughs> away. Oh, okay, all right. All right. Well, I don't know if that's good or bad. Okay. Uh, so. When, when I think about employers in general, about what I recommended to them on how to deal with these issues before the general counsel took my work away, I thought about it in terms of just, it's really good what the NLRB is doing. They're actually getting employers to kind of think more about their policies ahead of time and, and to think about how can I have a policy that address my interests while also protecting employees section seven rights. Now the one area the general counsel didn't deal with, I didn't see that in his, his description, something about at will policies was addressed by uh, the acting general counsel. And I've seen some employment counsel get upset, concerned that if they start to put too much language dealing with all of these exceptions, it'll swallow up the rule when they start talking about at will. And maybe that's one area we still need to look at. But if we're trying to resolve this, Right? We have to think about the Uber agency. They're the gladiators. They're on the front line. They're the ones dealing with these labor issues. They've got the expertise to address them. And they're the ones we want on the front line addressing these issues. Do we want judges? Do we want Supreme Court justices who don't know about workplace issues trying to figure out about the issues in terms of McDonald's or Purple Communications. No, we want the Uber agency expertise out there on the front line addressing these issues. Employers, it'll be better for you. You'll get better policies by having informed decisions by people who know about these problems and are trying to address them in a creative way. Adjudicating these workplace battles on the front line with all that expertise is what we want from our Uber agency. 
So as I finish this, I'm going to finish up since I was told about the time. Um, if you're thinking about Uber agencies, the NLRB is an Uber agency. It's a super agency for us when it comes to workplace issues of our time. We need an agency that's got all five members in place and a general counsel so we can put all that expertise to bear in addressing these pressing issues of the workplace right now. They can shine their uber light on these issues by helping us understand things that we need to have addressed in the workplace. The NLRB is strategically placed to be that uber, uber agency with the expertise of all five members, and we need to keep all five members in place, and using them as the frontline gladiators, this can help the workplace under labor law and in non-union workplaces. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Now, we've, we've heard a lot of uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking comments from the panel, questions from uh, the audience. Perhaps there were even pent-up questions from previous <laughs> panels. Well, OK, cool. Um, so one of my questions is, um, sort of building on the social media and the changes in technology. And I'm, I'm very curious to sort of get your perspectives um, on what you guys are observing out, you know, as people who've see, who maybe take a longer term perspective on some of these issues than um, practicing lawyers might, uh, as to where you think the next big areas and um, concentrated union activity is gonna be. Uh, we see Facebook, I imagine there might be other media, social media platforms and sort of getting your thoughts about um, sort of what's the future in light of purple communications and what the next sort of um, outlet will be for that sort of work. Jim, you want to comment? Well, I, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was that talked about, uh, um, was it was it Member Johnson, Johnson, Member Johnson was yeah. talking about, about how there are, uh, uh, numbers of platforms that are yet to be uh, litigated with respect to that and so I, and I think that was an excellent answer that he gave in terms of in terms of we're just scratching the surface on the application of this new technology both in in uh, um, union organizing and collective action and how the employees can access it and how they can express themselves uh, I think the board's made a good start uh, with all it's done but but I think that that will be a hot issue in the near future uh, um, I don't know what other yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is, I mean, one sort of interesting thing, at least for me, on all the social media uh, issues are, is, I mean, one, we don't know, right, by its very nature, right, that's what's exciting about that whole field is that, that in 10 years from now, it's something we've never heard of. Um, in sharp contrast, though, in a lot of ways, the legal issues are, are pretty well settled Section 8A1 activity, right? I mean, I remember when the first Facebook pages came came out, I don't know how many reporters I had to keep explaining to is there's actually a lot of settled, relatively settled board law underlying these issues. It, there obviously are some some facts that arise more often with social media that, that might present some, some factual challenges. Um, but for such an old statute that hasn't been amended that much, uh, it shows its flexibility um, and its ability to adapt, particularly with a, a good agency administering it. Um, so even though we don't know necessarily what might happen 10 years from now, it's a pretty safe bet the act will actually be able to uh, have some influence on it. I think also, I mean, the, our, our Walmart uh, uh, is a good example of what's going to happen with respect to collective action on the part of low-skilled workers. High-skilled workers, uh, we may see some traditional organizing. I, I don't know if, uh, I, I don't, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'm saying it too uh, quickly. Uh, professionals will probably, if they do organize, they probably organize differently than, than the traditional blue-collar workers. But, but um, certainly there's a lot of, I know among doctors now, the, you know the medical profession, uh, the the insurance companies are organizing to ne uh, negotiate with the doctors, and if the doctors don't organize, 
Uh, they, ha they, they don't have sufficient bargaining power with the insurance companies. Um, and both of those uh, uh, sides are growing in their economic power. And the doctors are beginning to feel like cogs in a wheel. They no longer feel like uh, independent professionals, the independent professionals of my childhood. They, they do feel like uh, we are employees. And they can be abused. I know that the, uh, um, we have uh, uh, Indiana University Health. Uh, which actually is not affiliated with the university, other than they paid us $9 million to take our, to take our name. Uh, they thought they would get name recognition out of that. They are buying up doctors' practices, and they are asking them to all sign non-competition clauses, which is fairly reasonable given the, the customer list. But then there are a lot of allegations that these doctors uh, never get another raise because now they have a non-competition clause, and uh, if they want to uh, leave, they will effectively have to uh, move and leave the city. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me that they that at some point um, professional employees like that who would have some bargaining power collectively might organize. Professor Green, <clears throat> with the whole world giving lip service to civility, parent teachers organizations seeking it, church groups seeking it, you and I were even on a committee in the ABA promoting civility. <laughs> How do you answer observers of the recent board decisions that say the board is anti-civility in the workplace, something that we all should aspire to, to make it a more pleasant place to go each day. Well, it, it, actually, I, th I think it's, uh, it's quite evident. When I said when I first saw the board members uh, even interacting, even as you've seen them here at this conference interacting, um, you can have divisions about how you think um, the act should be applied and still be civil, and still be cordial, and still feel like you are bought into the tenets of the act, and still respect each other. I did say when I first thought, when I first met them, I thought, oh, you were going to hear one of them take the old adage from the Saturday Night Live and go, Jane, you, and then say that to the other person. Um, but that was not what happened. And so I think that the, you can be civil, but the question is, do you have to agree? And so I actually think that this is a great time because when you look at the dissents, they also should inform the workplace a lot about how difficult these issues are and that they're and doing it in a civil way. I, I read the dissents and I don't feel like the dissents are you know attacking personally. They're just saying that you know we disagree about how the law should be resolved in this way. And I'm not talking about the board being civil. I'm talking about observers of some of these social media decisions where an oh. initial reading, a fair reading of Costco mm -hmm. by the ALJ seem like that's a good thing that people should treat each other more civilly in the workplace. Oh, Yet I see. The board seems to stamp out employer efforts to encourage gentleness. Yeah. Maybe you'd call it wimpiness by this uh, workplace, well, but, but a lot of employers really do want to see each other see people treat one another better in the workplace. I, I, well, well, in terms of that, I think you're right. I think that there are issues. But if you just read the uh, general council, I don't have to be in this cottage industry anymore. You just read the general con council's uh, memo about how to deal with those policies. It's still a balance. You're balancing Section 7 rights with employers' interests to address some of those things in the workplace. And yes, you know, in terms of civility and, and, and how you treat each other, either be it social media or even if you were just at the water cooler before social media, there are certain expectations about that. But those are difficult questions, I think. Those are difficult questions in terms of protecting the Section 7 right. Even if you go back to Livonia and you ask, well, is it harassment if I go up to someone and ask them if they want to be a member of a union and they don't and they say stop harassing me and then am I subject to the harassment policy? Those are balancing issues. Those are difficult questions. But who do we have answering those questions? <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> go ahead, Jim. Uh, uh, to uh, Professor Dow Schmidt's point on doctors organizing, approximately 15, 16 years ago, I went to a presentation. I was the staff, the in-house legal department for the bricklayers at the time. I went to a presentation by a physician, a couple others, 
who in Philadelphia came up with the idea of claiming that the health insurance companies were the employer, that they were employees, they went to the labor board, they filed a traditional petition, and then the Department of Devices, Section on Device, apparently kiboshed that idea, so it went away. But your thought was tried 15 years ago, which means it'll come back. And I, what I thought of just now was that they could form cooperatives like farmers have selling their crops, and then we will do the operation for X rate. If you don't pay that, we won't do the operation. And then if you get the economies of size, they could actually have some bargaining power. You can see why they would like to bargain with the insurance companies. And certainly, what, what little I know about this, I mean, I hear this from the doctors. Before the large health organizations started buying up the doctors' practices, the doctors complained mightily about the insurance companies shoving right. terms down their yeah. throat. And in my, in my, you know, in Bloomington, uh, Indiana University is the 600-pound is the, uh, gorilla, and if you, are, uh, Anthem is our insurer, and if you're not an Anthem provider, you lose all your customers. And so Anthem had a lot of power in going around and, and hammering them into, into uh, compliance with whatever Anthem wanted. Now IU Health has come around and bought up all these practices, and now we have essentially bilateral bargaining between IU Health and, and, and Anthem, among other insurers. I, I, uh, and the doctors now feel taken advantage of by IU Health. Um, I, I really <coughs> ended up talking to somebody who used to do a lot of uh, medical um, <coughs> economics and planning, yeah. and he thinks the future is are Kaiser Permanente operations yes. that will own hospitals and also sort of own the insurance companies. Yeah. Other questions? Well, there is a reception, and maybe that's beckoning to people. Uh, uh, but w once again, let, let me thank uh, the organizers of the conference, uh, especially Charlie and Ben and Katya and <coughs> Michael, despite his self-deprecating comments. Uh, On behalf all, of Sam, of I'd like to thank Rob, too, because he kept thanking Rob, and I didn't get to work with Rob, so. Oh. Uber well, organizer. Uber organizer. <laughs> uh, and thank all of our panelists, and especially thank the five members of our board and General Counsel Griffin for being with us today. We've all learned and benefited from this. Uh, Thank you, folks. Ben, you want to make a few comments? Uh, well, we're done. See you at the reception. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before you all leave. Um, if you uh, have parked and you need a parking validation uh, because you pay for CLEs, um, Katja, who's uh, right there, uh, is heading over to the table that you guys all signed in at, and we'll be able to help you take care of that. We do have a reception outside, so you should, I don't want to be the last thing between you and a reception. So thank you again for coming. Thank you.